and welcome to another episode of SCF Science Club for Girls Live. I'm Hannah with Science Club for Girls, and that was Mr. Music with your theme song. We're back to the trombone this week, Mr. Music. I missed it. It's great to have it back. Well, you know who else it's great to invite back to our show? Dr. Marbles! Let's welcome him in. Hey, Dr. Marbles! Yeah, no, hey! It's so great to see you again. It's been so long, Dr. Marbles. Oh, it's been way too long, Hannah. I'm so happy to see you. I'm happy to see you as well. Tell us a little bit about what you've been up to the last two weeks. Oh, hmm. Well, I've been working a lot. Been at the hospital, taking okay. care of taking care of patients. All right. And um, well. I've been doing what everybody's doing. I've been watching the elections. And I'll tell you something, Hannah. We yeah. weren't last. I know you guys talked last time, and I'm so sorry I missed it. But I, I know it's you okay. guys talked. I know you guys talked about probability. And wow, has that been a useful tool when I'm watching the elections, trying to figure out probability, state to state, candidate to candidate. Really cool and super helpful. Yeah, that's right. And if anything, this election has reminded me that probability is really just a guide. Sometimes it's not what actually ends up happening, and that's okay, because we can't be sure about certain things, and the election's definitely one of them. So use probability like a prediction. Use it like a guide. But I love that you brought that up, Dr. Marbles. Super cool. Did you say prediction? I did. No, not yet. Don't oh, put oh, okay. the chicken yet. Okay, okay, I, I, okay. Not yet, Ooh. not yet. All right, Dr. Marbles, I could talk about the election and prediction chicken all day, but we need yep. to move on to this week, okay? Yeah. So last Let's week, actually, speaking of which, last week we talked about augmented reality. We actually got a chance to see what exactly augmented reality is by experimenting with some really cool things. We also got to create a little bit of augmented reality of our own by using candles and glass to create a hologram, which is really neat. And then, Dr. Marbles, we talked to an augmented and virtual reality expert named Dr. Kate Donovan, and she told us about how she uses augmented reality in the hospital to both help doctors and to learn and also to help patients feel more comfortable about being in the hospital. So cool. Dr. Marbles, what do you think about augmented reality? Have you ever used it in your life? Hmm. You know, Hannah, I was thinking about that. First yeah. of all, I think it's super cool. And really I think cool. we'll see more and more augmented reality in the future. So many cool applications. Like, I don't know, being able to see a piece of furniture in your house before you actually buy it. Or right. maybe put and to see if it actually fits with the room and everything. Yeah, or maybe you could, you know, try on clothes or something. Well, the, pl the place I was curious, like when I do the apps on my phone and I can like put a bird in the space or a, sometimes I'll put a dog in honor of Louie. Oh. I love Louie. <laughs> we all but do. Would, <laughs> would that be augmented reality if you put things in the space with you? That's a great question. And it definitely would be. That's a perfect example of augmented reality because you're putting something that's virtual, something that's made on a computer, in with your own reality. It's like when you have a filter on your phone to make your face look funny, right? Like you still have your face, which is reality, but then you're adding something to it that's made on a computer. And that's exactly what augmented reality is. Last week, we talked about how the word augment means to add, right? To add something else to reality. Pretty cool. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, Dr. Marbles, we're, it's time to step away from augmented reality and head back to reality. And there's actually been a lot happening in reality in addition to the election. And that is, there's been so many changes that I've noticed outside. And have you noticed any changes when you step outside, Dr. Marbles? Any changes? Yeah. What have you noticed? I mean, I don't know, last week maybe? Like, Four inches of snow. That's yeah. right. <laughs> That's me, Hannah. You sent us this photo. What's going on? Well, what's going on? 
I spent three hours making myself into a snowman. Not wow, bad. A lot of time. <laughs> oh, I can't believe you put that picture up. That's so funny. Yeah. Well, it's definitely been a pretty dramatic change. I've also noticed that the temperature outside is dropping, and I need to wear my winter coat a lot more often now. And that must mean these changes must mean that the season is changing. There's actually four different seasons that we experience here on Earth. Winter, spring, autumn, and summer. What is your favorite season, Dr. Marbles? Hmm. Uh, I'll be honest with you, Hannah, I love them all. But if you ask me which my favorite, I'd probably say autumn, the hmm. fall. And why is that, Dr. Marbles? Well, I'll tell you, what I love about the fall, like the picture behind you, Hannah, is I love the change of the colors of the leaves. And actually, yeah, it's, that's how I know what season I'm in. I kind of just look at the leaves. When it's green, summer. And then it ends up starting to get a little bit yellow. And that's kind of the fall. And then they fall off, and that's winter. And then little buds start to form. Spring. Yeah. You can tell a lot just by looking at the trees. That's really cool. And that's a great way to remember. If you haven't had a chance yet, go ahead and type in the chat your favorite season. I'd love to hear. Now, Dr. Marbles, you brought up leaves changing, and that's going to be our second experiment today. So stay cool. tuned because we'll learn about why leaves change color. Cool. Well, what other changes do you notice in the fall besides temperatures changing and leaves changing? Oh, oh, I'll tell you what I did notice. Yeah. yeah. And I notice that every year. Yeah, I notice flocks of birds flying yeah. overhead. But you know what? They're flying in one direction. Not all over the place. In one direction. And where is that? Hmm. I think they're flying south. I think they're flying to where it's warm, Hannah. Oh, that's often why, like, during the winter, I usually want to go somewhere where it's warmer because it's so cold here. I totally yep. get it. Birds are smart. Birds are really smart. Well, another change that I've noticed related to animals is I've been noticing that squirrels are getting kind of chunky. They're eating a ton recently. And this is kind of, be this is because they're preparing for something called hibernation, which is kind of like when they just sleep all winter to avoid the really cold temperatures. It's also really difficult for them to find food in the winter because as we're talking about, the leaves start to go away and the plants start to go away. And so it's easier for them just to kind of sleep it out. Pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dr. Marbles, it's time to talk about why are these things happening? Why exactly are we experiencing seasons? And uh, yeah, you ready to dive in? Sure am. Cool. Well, here's the earth. Now, the earth can be divided into two different sections. And to show this, I'm actually going to use a round object, like a styrofoam ball. Now, if you're at home and you don't have a styrofoam ball, but you still want to model the earth, you can use anything round, a tennis ball, a piece of fruit, uh, really anything, a clay ball. Now, as I was saying, the earth can be divided into two parts. And those two parts are separated by something called the equator. Dr. Marbles, have you ever heard of the equator? Sure have. Very cool. It's, well, like a, it's like a belt around the world. That's exactly what it's like. And it's important to note that although I'm drawing the equator on, it's really an invisible line. It's not something that you can actually see, but it's obviously easier if we draw it on for our Earth model. All right. So up at the top, we have the Northern Hemisphere. And down at the bottom, we have the Southern Hemisphere. Now we in Massachusetts or in the United States live in, which hemisphere do we live in, Dr. Marbles? Hmm. Oh, that's easy. The Northern Hemisphere. That's right. Now to represent our country, America, in the Northern Hemisphere, I'm gonna put a red push pin. All right, now right below us in the Southern Hemisphere, is another country, Argentina. There are also a lot of other countries in the Southern Hemisphere, but Argentina is kind of cool. Now, to represent Argentina, I'm going to put a black pushpin. 
All right. So there's us at the top in the Northern Hemisphere, and there's Argentina down in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, Dr. Marbles, here's something really, really cool. The Earth doesn't really look like this. It actually looks like this. This invisible line that's kind of going through the uh, top, this North Pole and the South Pole, is called the axis. And it's the thing that the Earth re-rotates around, like this. Hmm. Now, what do you notice about the axis, Dr. Marbles? Uh, it's not straight up and down. That's right. It's tilted. And we'll soon see that this tilt is so important in creating our seasons. Okay. Hey, Hannah. Hey, Hannah, hey. I'm tilted. Hey, Hannah, I'm tilted. Oh, you're just like the axis, Dr. Marbles. Yep, I'm Very tilted. cool. Oh, I'm so glad that you did that. That was helpful. Yeah. All right, now for our model. You can use a couple different things to model the sun, but I'm gonna use a flashlight because that's what provides light like the sun does. All right, now, when I shine a flashlight on our earth like this, Dr. Marbles, which place either America or Argentina is getting the most direct sunlight. Where is the sun shining on the most direct? Hmm. Looks like Argentina, Hannah, from here. It, yeah, it does. Argentina is kind of pointed towards the sun. Now, yeah. okay, if it's getting more sunlight, what do you think the weather is like there, Dr. Marbles? Ah, uh, it's going to be nice and hot. It's going to be nice and hot. And what season does that remind you of? Nice, hot weather. Summer. Exactly. So Argentina is experiencing summer right now. But mm. let's take a look at America at the top. We said that America was not getting as much sunlight. So what kind of weather do you think we're experiencing in America right now? <laughs> Cold weather, like winter, the beginnings of winter. Exactly. Wait, so does that mean that when we're experiencing winter, Argentina's experiencing summer? Hmm. That's crazy. Hmm. Very I wonder. I wonder if that has something to do with the tilt or something having to do with the relationship of the earth and the sun that's and the way they and the way they move with each other. Yeah, that's a great question. Well, let's take a look at what would happen if we were to continue to revolve around the sun until we were all the way over here. Mm. Okay, what's going on now, Dr. Marbles? Looks Who's like experiencing the more direct sunlight. Looks like it's summertime where are we are. It does, right? Because we are facing towards the sun. And what about in Argentina? Winter. Exactly, because they are tilted away from the sun. So hey. it's all depend. Yeah. Hey, I'm going to make a guess that okay. the time it takes for that rotation to happen once is a year. It is. That's exactly right. Wait, the time it takes to make one fold to go all the way around? Yeah, I'm guessing that it takes a year to go around. Exactly. It does take a year, 365 days, to make one full revolution around the sun. Great point. <laughs> wow. So smart, Dr. Marbles. Well, Why they call me doctor. That's right. That's right. Well, super cool. Now we figured out why we experience seasons and the importance of the tilt, right? If we didn't have that tilt, do you think we'd experience different seasons, Dr. Marbles? Hmm. Maybe not. Yeah. It'd kind of be the same temperature pretty much like all year round, which is, wouldn't be as exciting, actually. No. Well, and I wouldn't be able to wear as many coats. Exactly. Exactly. You wouldn't be able to have a spring coat and a summer coat and a winter coat and yeah. a fall coat. Although I don't know why you have a I summer can't, coat, but yeah. I can't wear my leather jacket all year round. I, that would be so silly, Dr. Marbles. I, do you have one? Is it really just question? Is it only really one leather jacket or do you have multiple? Multiple. Okay. I've, I've been wondering because I've often seen you in the same outfit. So I was just. No, I, I have multiple, but they're all the same. You know why? Why? Because I like what I like. <laughs> I'm so glad. That's <laughs> awesome. You keep doing you, Dr. Marbles. All right, we'll check in with you soon. We're going to talk about leaves now, okay? Okay, bye. All right, see ya. 
All right, so now that we've talked about seasons and why we experience different seasons, it's time to talk about the other change that we experience, and that is leaves changing color. Why does this happen? Well, let's take a look. Now, before we actually jump into our experiment, it's time to review what we've talked about in the past. Think back to our episode about plants and photosynthesis. We started to talk about photosynthesis being super important because it's the way that plants get their energy, that glucose. Plants make their own food, unlike humans who have to eat things for food. Now, do you remember the three ingredients that plants need in order to go through photosynthesis? Hmm, what were those three ingredients? Hopefully, you said water, sunlight, and carbon dioxide. Those are those three really important ingredients that plants need to go through photosynthesis. Now, sunlight is extremely important. And there's a certain thing in a plant, in a uh, plant cell, that helps to absorb that light. And that's what's called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is also what gives leaves in the summer that bright green color. But sometimes that chlorophyll starts to break down. So let's go ahead and explore a little bit more. Now, in order to explore why chlorophyll or how chlorophyll breaks down and shows these other colors, we're gonna do something called chromatography. And we actually did chromatography a little while back during our colors episode. We use black ink to help separate those colors. Now, if we do chromatography with a leaf, meaning if we put a leaf in a liquid and try and separate those colors, what do you think is gonna happen? Hmm, I think it's time for a prediction chicken! Prediction chicken! Prediction chicken! Prediction chicken! Oh, Dr. Donald, I missed Prediction Chicken. I'm so glad that he's back. Has he been busy as well? Super busy. Yeah. Have you have you been busy? Hey, come on up here. Have you been busy? What? Yeah, you're in my eye. Yeah, it was right in your eye. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right, I'll let her know. What is that? All right. All right. Okay. All right. He said he's not so busy. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, maybe we need to give him some work to do. I think anyway, he's got... actually, now he's back to do some work. Okay, Dr. Yeah, I, 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 Hannah, I think he's got bandwidth. <laughs> I think so. All right. Well, if anyone's looking to hire, Prediction Chicken is available. Anyway, yep. back to our Prediction Chicken. Yeah. So, Dr. Marbles, we are going to explore why leaves change color in the fall. And to do that, we're going to use chromatography, which if you remember, oh, we've done that in yeah. the past. Do you remember I that? Totally, I totally remember that. This is going to be easy. Okay. So, let's say that we're going to, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to break up a leaf, put some um, rubbing alcohol in there, put a piece yeah. of paper, and try to experience chromatography. What do you think yeah. we're going to see? Well, we're gonna see. when we did the black chromatography, uh, we saw, I think I remember we saw the black color, but then it separated into all sorts of colors, lots more than we thought. Right. So my guess is when we do chromatography on the leaf, we might see the hidden colors inside the leaf start to reveal themselves and we'll see different colors. That's my guess. That's okay. my prediction. That's a great prediction, Dr. Marbles, and I love how you use previous experience, like that experiment that we did in the color episode, to then relate it to what's gonna happen now. Perfect yeah. prediction, perfect hypothesis. All right, Thank you we'll much. do the experiment and we'll check back in with you to see if your prediction was right. I'll be right here. Great. All right, so now it's time to do our experiment. For this experiment, you're going to need a leaf. Now, ideally, you would use a green leaf, but because it's fall, those are hard to find. So a yellow leaf will work as well. You're also going to need a jar. And the first thing you're going to do is break your leaf up into teeny tiny pieces and put it in the jar. Just like this. You also want it to be a pretty fresh leaf. So if you find a leaf on the ground that's probably kind of dead, 
those don't work as well. All right, that should be good enough. Okay, now it's time to squish your leaf. You can use a muddler like this, or you can also use a spoon. That works too. You wanna squish your leaf down like this, and do this for a pretty long time, actually. All right, now ideally I would keep going for about another minute, but you get the idea. Okay, now you wanna cover your leaf with rubbing alcohol. Because rubbing alcohol is a chemical, we need to be super safe. So one, make sure an adult is around and they can supervise, and two, make sure you have something to protect your eyes because we are using a chemical. So I'm going to put on safety goggles. All right, cover your leaf with rubbing alcohol until it's just covered. Like that. Just a little bit of rubbing alcohol, nothing too crazy. Okay, now you're going to want to put in your paper that's going to help with the chromatography. Coffee filters work really well. So what you'll want to do is cut a strip. Because otherwise it's going to be way too big. All right. Like that. All right. Next, you're going to want to low or your coffee filter into the water, or sorry, into the rubbing alcohol until it just hits the surface of the alcohol. You can tape your paper to the side of the jar to make sure that it stays. Like so. Cool. And then you'll want to be patient. You'll want to leave your coffee filter in your rubbing alcohol for at least an hour and then come back and check on it. Now, because this takes some time, I have a photo of what it most likely will look like at the end. So let's take a look. Pretty cool. Now, this person did an experiment with, or the same experiment with different color leaves, and you can kind of see what happens. Let's bring back Dr. Marbles to discuss our results. Hey, Dr. Hey. Marbles. Hey, hey, Hannah. That that turns out really kind of pretty to look yeah. at. It's kind of beautiful colors that come from those leaves. I'm gonna try that for sure. It's kind of cool. Well, what do you notice? Tell me what you observe. Well, it looks like, for example, that really dark leaf all the way on the right. But when you do the chromatography, you see that inside there's actually pink and red and even a little bit of black or dark colors as well. And then the red one also is not just red, but inside you also see some orange and other colors also. Yeah. But I have, cool. a, I have a question, Hannah. Yeah. What happens to the chlorophyll? How does it break down? I thought it was like chlorophyll was super strong. That's a, yeah, well, that's a great question. Remember, chlorophyll is what gives those leaves that bright green color. And yeah. so if it breaks down, they can no longer have that bright green color. And instead, they have these other colors that we're seeing, like yellow and orange. Now, remember, chlorophyll is really important because it absorbs light. And we learned right. from that previous experiment, what's different about summer and fall? Uh, oh, 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 yeah. oh, 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 Dr. Marbles, do you know? Yep. What is summer, it? Summer, during summer, there's more sun exposure. There's more light. Right. And in the winter, hmm, I'm looking out the window now here, it's dark. Exactly. So without that light to absorb, that chlorophyll starts to break down and expose these other colors like uh, yellow and orange. Wait, 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 Hannah, I think yeah? I got it. So you're saying, let me see if I can put this all together. Put together experiment one and the second experiment? Yep. Oh my gosh, go for it. So I'm thinking the earth is tilted, it makes its way around, and in the summer, it's nice and sunny. So the leaves need to make food, so they start making chlorophyll. And when they make chlorophyll, they turn green. Then right. the earth starts to turn, and it's turning through the seasons. And now it's getting darker, less light, less chlorophyll. So the leaves start to change color. They get to be more yellow and red, and then hmm, they fall off, right off the tree in the winter. Right. And then it starts all over again. <laughs> exactly. It's kind of cool to just observe the change that happens. 
especially in the winter when it gets really, really dark and there's not enough sunlight, the plants can't go through photosynthesis. And so the leaves start falling off. Reminds me of the old saying, April showers make May flowers. That's exactly right. I'm glad yeah. that you brought that up. Well, Dr. Marbles, I love seeing all the changes that happen in the fall and it really makes me appreciate this amazing environment that we live in. And Marisa, who's a student at the University of Connecticut, is studying natural resources because she also just loves the changes that we experience in our environment. So mm. our friend Tanya had a chance to talk to her about it. And do you want to take a look? Oh, yeah. Cool. Let's take a look. Hi, thanks so much for joining us today, Marissa. Could you please um, introduce yourself? Yes, I'd love to. So my name is Marisa Naclerio. I am a junior at the University of Connecticut, and I study natural resources in the environment with a focus on conservation and sustainability. That's awesome. Uh, what is a typical day like as a natural resources student? <laughs> you spend a lot of time outside. So usually you can find me walking the forest, measuring the diameter of trees, or catching crayfish in a pond. That's awesome. And how did you become interested in the environment? I became interested in the environment when I was super young. I always loved the ocean, and I knew that I wanted to learn more about it and the environment in general. So I ended up going to a marine sciences high school where I loved just being by the water and learning all about the earth's processes. And so it led me to come to UConn and keep studying the environment. And uh, what, what are your classes like? I have a lot of classes that take you outside. So um, a lot of classes that teach you how to measure different parts of the environment, like trees or streams, um, and learn about things like the seasons um, and temperatures. So a lot of classes that involve science, um, you have to use math and a little bit of chemistry too. And do you have a favorite season? Ooh, my favorite season is winter because I love the snow. Why do you think that it's important that we study the earth? So it's important to study the earth because we all live on it and the earth is responsible for so many different parts of our life. And that's where we get our food and our water from. And it's something that we interact with every day, even if we don't realize it. And so, especially now that the climate is changing, it's really important to understand why it's changing and our part in it. I definitely agree. Um, so what do you wanna do when you graduate? I wanna become a professor. I am really interested in teaching other people about the environment and I love talking to people so I can always see myself bringing people out into nature, showing them what I learned as an undergraduate and just having a fun time learning about the outdoors. That's really exciting. What advice do you have for uh, the audience watching? I would say ask questions. Always ask questions. Even if it may be intimidating, um, researchers love, love, love getting questions about their work because it shows that you're as excited about their work as they are. And so, you know, especially even if it's intimidating um, and even if maybe you think that your question isn't the smartest or you think that your question is wrong, there's no such thing as a wrong question and there's no such thing as a bad question because the only way to learn is to, by asking questions. Could you tell me about uh, your favorite class that you've taken? Ooh, so my favorite class is called Global Climate Change and Human Society. And it's looking at the effect of climate change on people and how there are different effects on climate change in different parts of the world and how some parts of the world are seeing sea level rise and warming temperatures quicker than other places in the world. Are you in any clubs that are related to the environment? I am. So I'm actually an intern at the Office of Sustainability here at UConn, and we do a lot of work in making sure that our campus is green and clean, and also trying to involve students in sustainability, especially students that maybe didn't think that that was something we did on campus. And I also dabble a little bit in our student group called Eco Husky, which does a lot of uh, raising awareness about the environment and teaching people how to appreciate it through small things, just like looking at the stars. That's awesome. I love that. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a good Thank one.
Thanks for having me. Cool. Wow. <laughs> Super cool. What did you think of Mar Marissa? Well, she's amazing. As always, your guests are incredible women. And uh, I would say, here's the thing that I find amazing about her work and what I find amazing about the environment is sometimes we think about ourselves and the environment as being two different things. You know, there's me and then there's a tree. But actually, we learned actually in one of our classes together, in one of our sessions, Hannah, that we, for example, we breathe oxygen and trees make oxygen. And then we breathe out carbon dioxide and trees breathe in carbon dioxide. And when we're cold, we go inside and find warmth for our bodies. And when we're hot, we go outside and we experience the wind. And so in some ways, we and the environment are one thing and not two things. And that's why it's so important to have people like Marissa studying how to make the environment as good as it can be. Because in, in some ways, the better the environment is, the better we are. So I think she's doing incredibly important work and I thank her for it. Yeah, I love that. I like that you're you're saying the better the earth is, the better that we are. I like I agree. Yeah. Very cool. Well I said more I said more than that, but but that's basically it. I just am summarizing it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Dr. Marvels, it's been great having you on the show. I'm so glad you could join us again. We've missed mm -hmm. you, so I'm glad mm -hmm. you could take time off a busy schedule. My pleasure. I'm so glad. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone can join us again next week for another episode of SCFG Live. Science Club for Girls Live. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.